to our Genius Hours Career Success event. Let me do a quick check, make sure you see our screen. Okay, let me know if you don't see it. Uh, so this is a series of events where design mentors come together to provide uh, tips, insights into the how-tos and what should I do's of building and navigating a successful career. And today we're gonna learn about how to sharpen our interview skills. But first, let me introduce myself, what ADP List is, and what to expect for this event before Right. So first, uh, my name is Ying Yao. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a senior UX designer at Honeywell, co-organizer of Ladies at UX Atlanta, and a design mentor at ADP List and Design Buddies. And what is ADP List? So it stands for Amazing Design People List. So it's a global community for making genuine connections, a platform where people can find, book, and meet mentors from all around the world. So our mission is to foster an inclusive uh, space and support network for designers to come together, learn from each other, and strive to be better. So if you haven't had a chance to check out our community, head over to adplist.org after this event. All right, uh, we have uh, some community milestones that we're super proud of. So since ADP List started last year, we have grown immensely. We now have over 2,000 mentors on the platform, leading to over 5,000 one-on-one sessions. And we've hosted over 80 events, uh, tackling a variety of topics. And pro tip, a lot of these events are recorded. I saw a couple of questions in the chat, and they're shared on our YouTube channel. So. With our platform touching over 70 countries, we're very proud of the global impact that we've had on connecting people together. All right, a couple of housekeeping guidelines and rules for this event. This, so this will be recorded and will be accessible afterwards. Uh, we have a handy dandy pigeonhole link that we will use for our Q&A. And the nice thing about that is that you get to vote for which question you want our speak speakers to tackle. Uh, please keep, uh, please know hate speech or discriminatory behavior, keep it nice and cool. Um, and is our, as is our tradition, we will <clears throat> take a group selfie in just a moment. And finally, please, please share your takeaways on social media by tagging at ADP list and hashtag amazing together. Okay, with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can do our selfie. So bring, so if you can, Turn on your cameras, bring your happiest smiles. We're gonna do our selfie and then kick off the event. Okay, Michelle, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. I can see all the amazing smiley faces over there. There are about uh, seven screens. So I'll quickly go through those screens and we can continue. So please hold your pose, you know, smile, give us video smiles. Screen one, three, two, one, go, okay. Now I'm going to go to screen two, three, two, one, go. Amazing. Happy faces out there. Screen three, three, two, one, go. And I'll quickly do screen four, three, two, one, go. Screen five. Almost and, there. Yeah, almost there, almost there, <laughs> almost there. Screen six, seven, and the last screen screen eight and yes that is it thank Woo! you so much back to you good job everyone sunny smiles all around okay so today we're going to learn how to sharpen our interview skills like we would sharpen a fine blade with intention practice and precision so interviews are a key are key for landing your next job but not everyone knows how to ace them and stand out in a pool of candidates in the market. So how do you prepare and showcase your best and brightest professional self for your next interview? So our guest speakers today, Jen Enrique, who's a staff product designer uh, from Slack, and Mahak Sharma, who's a senior product designer from Agoda Services, will share their tips and first-hand experiences so you can sharpen your interview skills and land your dream job. And then afterwards, we will do an AMA with our speakers. So if you have any burning questions, please use that pigeonhole link in the chat to submit your question and we can review them afterwards. Okay, with that, Jen, Mahak, if you can unmute yourselves and give a short introduction, who you are, your role, 
fun fact about yourself and and then I'll hand it over to you. So great, thanks Yang. Uh, Matt, do you wanna go first? Okay, cool. Hey guys, really nice to meet you uh, today. My name is Mehek and I am a senior product designer with Agoda for the last two years. And uh, I have been a UX designer for about uh, six years and uh, I've been working with uh, EDB list for the past six months. And um, I have covered both sides of enterprise design as well, uh, as, well as uh, consumer design. And I'm very happy to be here. A uh, fun fact about me is that I'm a certified uh, scuba diving uh, instructor. Thank you. Nice. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jen. Pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a staff product designer at Slack. Um, I, I've had 14 years of experience doing design just across consumer, enterprise, mobile, like almost growth design. And now I work at Slack on just business software um, and connecting the world. And a fun fact about me is that last year I spent over 270 hours playing Animal Crossing. No regrets. Um, so, so excited everyone's here today um, and really hoping we can share what we know from our time working at our respective companies and from our within our careers. Um, Let's see if I can move forward. And just so excited to be able to like talk with you all and hear your questions and hopefully get to some questions in the Q&A after. So what you can expect, um, we'll go over the hiring funnel. It's a really nice way to think about a framework for approaching hiring and like preparing for your interviews. And then we'll go into some tips for how to prepare for different parts of that on-site interview. And then we just have a few things at the end about mindset in general. Cool. So let's as uh, thanks Jen for the great uh, introduction. So as Jen said that let's go over the hiring funnel. So this is the entire process of hiring. And these are the series of stages through which a candidate is considered for employment. And as we all know, like, you know, like when you apply to jobs that are like about hundreds and thousands of applicants, and then the entire funnel keeps going into like smaller steps. And finally, it's only about like a quarter or like even lesser uh, than that, uh, the people who actually uh, you know, come in for the interviews and post that if you're really successful for the interview, then the offer gets extended. So today, I think, uh, yeah, we'll explain a little more about the hiring funnel and uh, where do presentation and interviews come in. Next slide. So, you know, at every stage of the funnel from the very top, when you first submit your application to like when you get the offer, there's like different skills that you'll be flexing and showcasing. So at the very top of the funnel, when you apply, um, recruiters and hiring managers wanna see your portfolio. And that portfolio, it's usually a website. Sometimes people submit slides or PDFs. Um, that portfolio is supposed to give them an idea of like who you are as a designer and how you solve problems. And often that, like if you have a really stellar portfolio, if like the stars align and what you have shown in your portfolio matches what they're looking for, you'll move on to the first call. So a recruiter might reach out, a hiring manager might reach out and just schedule some time to chat with you. And this is your chance to kind of show your personality, talk about you and what you're really interested in um, in your work and also just convey how excited you are in the company. Um, and once you pass that one, if the recruiter or hiring manager thinks like, you know what, I think they have the package, they have the portfolio, they've demonstrated they can do the work and they've demonstrated interest and passion for this role, they'll bring you on site. On, I put it in quotes here because uh, these days it's often um, remote. Uh, but that interview is meant to um, help the team who hasn't really seen your portfolio yet um, get a sense of how you talk about your work and how you solve problems. So who you talk to on that first phone call might not be the people or the person you talk to on the onsite. And oftentimes it is comprised of like a presentation to begin with, with a number of people, some who might be on the team you're joining, and then interviews one-on-one -on -one with folks on the team. Um, and we'll get into like that 
a little bit later. And then once the offer is extended, you know, there's a whole set of different skills there that are required of you, namely negotiation. But for today, we'll be focusing on a little bit on presentations, but mostly on the interviews. Cause I think we think like the interviews is where you can really um, showcase who you are if you come in prepared and can just like knock it out of the park. Um, and just something, just before we get into the tips and like how to, how to prepare, we just wanna to convey to you all that the majority of interviews are set up to ask questions. So they're really looking for you to talk about your process, your design quality, how you, how you define quality, your behavior, especially in challenging situations and conflict, and just your general approach to design and, my, and, and your general mindset. Um, this gives them a really good idea of how you might fare working there. And oftentimes uh, hiring managers are really looking for like a really good combination of things here. You don't have to be a super experienced designer or like the best at everything, but it should show, you should be showcasing your awareness and your ability to kind of think through things and tell stories and convey uh, what you need to really clearly. Cool. So as Jen mentioned, like this is a time when a lot of uh, people ask us questions and we can like really, um, you know, present ourselves to the companies and, you know, sort of give information about ourselves. So basically this is your interview is your opportunity to uh, drive the process by yourself. And uh, when I say what is um, driving the interview really mean? So this is your opportunity to like take initiative. So, you know, like it's always good to have an introduction from the interviewers and the company about themselves a little bit. And then you can always, you know, start to introduce yourself and uh, basically express your, why are you interested in the company? And, you know, like some of the fun facts that interested you uh, to gravitate towards the company. And uh, this is your chance to even showcase like one or two of your top uh, case studies and you know like really drive through what you have worked on and you know like what was the challenges uh, that you faced in the product um, or the project and uh, you know like uh, go in depth uh, with your case studies and uh, this is also a very good opportunity for uh, candidates to ask questions about the company so for example, like a lot of things like you might not understand, for example, like, you know, like how is the design culture at the company? Like how, how do the, um, you know, diversity, uh, uh, how do diversity rules uh, sort of apply in the company? And, you know, like uh, what sort of professional de uh, development um, uh, opportunities are there for you? And uh, does the uh, design company like really critique their work? So this also gives you a very good idea to sort of understand that would your personality or your work in the future also work for the company as much as the company uh, would sort of uh, like want you. So, yeah. So uh, taking initiative, like I said, like uh, it's about asking expectations for the on-site, like once you're in a different location, like how do the, or, you know, like the office setup work, like who are you going to be working with in uh, certain projects. And mm -hmm. like I mentioned, like why are you excited about joining the company? So uh, I think like uh, I do take a few interviews for Agoda and you know, like it's always interesting to know if the candidate has come up with some sort of a interesting insight. For example, like um, I'm in the travel business right now and it's not really doing well, but then there are a lot of people who come up and say like, hey, you know what? I'm interested uh, to apply in Agoda because this is an opportunity to improve the user experience so that when travel finds opens up we can have like a really good experience for our uh, travelers and this seems to be like a really uh, interesting uh, insight for me when I hear that people uh, talk about like why are they interested rather than you know like a very standard line about like hey I'm a UX designer I love UX and that's what I want so you know just give yourself that edge and uh, um, in your uh, project uh, 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 in your project presentation you know, like you can always go more in depth than what is there in your portfolio. So for example, you can openly talk about your challenges um, and uh, why something uh, was designed a certain way, but did not showcase in the same way because of tech constraints, et cetera, et cetera. Or do you have like, can you justify why your project is a certain way, depending on like what data or information or research you did? And uh, always, always be prepared for uh, answering uh, 
for asking questions to the company because that also is taken in a very very positive way and it shows that you're very interested to apply with the company yeah and and just to add on to that um i've been on the other side of hiring for the past few years for like mid-sized to larger companies and we always make note when we do our write-ups of candidates like the questions they ask us and we really notice like across interviews if the candidate asks each interviewer a different question that kind of digs into different aspects of what they're interested in and the design team or the design culture or the company at large. And I think it shows like a lot of maturity if you are thinking about what you want and asking the questions to get the answers that will help you make the decision if this is the right company for you. Agreed, yep. Um, So, We're gonna go into three parts about how to prepare for different types of questions. This first one is about process questions. So oftentimes questions will be asked of you about how you work and solve problems. And this will often, you know, tie in really directly to your presentation. And so what's important here? Like the hiring manager, your your future potential teammates, they all wanna know if you how you how you present your work and tell the story of your work. Um, They want to know, like for your case study, why the project matters, that you understand the business needs supporting it or driving it. And they want to know that you understand the pain points and needs of your users. So it's really clear what you're designing for and what your goals are in in, in your process of solving problems. And then, of course, it's really important to talk about how you solve problems. and how you tackle that and make, make sense of ambiguity and get to like a very, very uh, to confidence in your solution through the design activities you choose to showcase. And then this is a bonus, like I know for a lot of new designers or people right out of school, but it's a lot harder to um, demonstrate stakeholder management or even data informed design. Um, but if you have somehow managed to demonstrate those skills, even in your student projects or your like, um, your, your side hustles, um, it's a really good, good thing to showcase that you are self-aware enough to handle problems and conflicts that arise and that you're very aware of like how data can inform your design and drive it forward. So some of those questions might look like, um, describe your typical design process. Uh, tell me about a time you were surprised by users' reactions during user research. And pro tip, if you have any data points that support your design, mention them. And oftentimes I think like a lot of designers think that you need hard data. Have I been muted? But oftentimes data, data also can be qualitative. It can be like something that you observed in maybe guerrilla research or like user testing you've run. And it doesn't have to be like a hard number and quantitative all the time. Um, And then just some common missteps that we've seen in um, just interview processes. Sometimes the why, what, and how don't actually map back to the final work or outcome. And the, and the specifically is like in the presentation and case studies. Um, and you might, you might get a hint of that happening or people not quite connecting it when you get questions during your presentation. And oftentimes those questions aren't like a thing to be scared about. Um, sometimes like we, I know that I purposely ask like hard questions during a presentation just to get a sense of how someone handles like talking about conflict or being challenged and the design solution they chose. Um, So it's definitely not like a time to get defensive. It's just like a time to be curious about what what they're looking for and then acknowledging if maybe there's gaps in your process. Um, Another common misstep is sometimes there is a missing explanation or justification of the design activities that are chosen. Um, And it's good to be just very intentional and like connect what you're doing to the final outcome, especially if it's helping you like remove ambiguity and get get really clear um, about the solutions that you've come up with. Uh, And it's okay to be different. So like every design process is different. Um, There's never a perfect design process and it's especially true 
like when you become a working designer, you'll start to see like different problems require different ways of approaching it, different design activities. And sometimes you might not need to do user research for something that's very straightforward, or you might have a problem that requires a lot of user research and design research up front. And then lastly, sometimes there's too much focus on the context. And so um, I've seen designers get caught up in the story of telling the story. And they, there might be like many, many slides about like the team makeup and who's on the team and like, like a big diagram about the design process. Um, oftentimes that's more of a distraction and really like your main focus should be on conveying how you solved the problem. Cool. So next step is to um, how to how to prepare for design quality questions. So what do we mean by uh, design quality? So design quality means like the output of your work. Next slide. So um, showing the design quality of your work is very important as a designer. And, uh, you know, like this could be like also like a very crucial step where you can actually showcase your work and showcase the output and also like go behind the scenes of what was done in the project. And uh, so basically companies want to uh, be able to hear that how can you simplify complexity. As designers, we handle like really complex projects and they all have like a lot of nuances, but it's very essential that um, in interviews where we have like a uh, really limited time to explain, you know, like uh, just prepare for like, what is the story that you're going to tell to the interviewer and what are like three or four edge cases that you want to highlight so that it's very easy for the interviewer to also sort of understand in those given 15 minutes what your project was about. And you can uh, also talk about like designing within constraints. So in a lot of companies today, like um, big tech companies, you know, like um, as designers, we always uh, design for the ideal use case. But a lot of times what we design does not go into production because it could be a lot of issues. For example, like the dev teams are like really tiny or there are like a lot of um, uh, constraints. And sometimes uh, teams just decide to go scrappy. So, you know, like, always have a justification. You can always tell the interviewer um, that, you know, like you prepare for the ideal use cases, but it's always really nice to uh, also understand that why this uh, product looks this uh, in real life and, you know, what are the dev constraints behind it? Because this uh, personally to me also, I feel that it gives a, a insight that a designer knows a little bit more than only um, designing for wireframes. They sort of understand the business context and they are also interested in understanding like how um, the uh, sort of like tech side works and what are like the dev constraints. And, uh, you know, like uh, more than that, um, also you can also focus on your uh, case studies where you can showcase that why you chose one sort of an interaction over the other, what in your case, it could be possible that in your case, like one interaction could really work well than something very similar. And um, also, like I mentioned before, like um, if you can tease out any of the edge cases that you could take care of, uh, that is a bonus point because it just shows that, you know, like just you looked at the happy flow, but you also looked at like the edge cases, uh, which could like really help uh, you know, users to, uh, it could help the end users to take care of like certain scenarios. Um, cool. So uh, a few uh, design quality questions that can be uh, asked in interviews is that, uh, what were some of the challenges um, that you faced during the development of your design? So feel free to step into uh, sort of talking about the nuances of like, uh, discussing the uh, design with the product team, discussing it with the dev teams. And um, also it's interesting to know if you came up with a design and were able to incorporate some other feedback based on like design critiques or based on like some discussions with development where you realize that, you know, a certain use case or design could not go well. So that's why you changed it. And that also gives a lot of insight into like how you collaborate with the other teams. Uh, in your company and uh, also like um, justification of like why you chose like one UI pattern over another. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So uh, some of the common missteps um, in this step can also be that, you know, a lot of times like, um, you know, we don't give credit to the team and uh, as an interviewer, it sometimes becomes very clear when uh, a use case or project has come in front of you in the design 
and the designer uh, pretty much says that hey you know what i designed from end to end which is true in certain cases it is possible but if you have collaborated with someone or if there's been any sort of a design input make sure uh, you also credit the other teammates and other team members because it just shows like that you can also play um, as a, a you know as a team player and you're not like a individual contributor who just you know like so it it definitely like um, gives you uh, brownie points um <clears throat> and yeah so sometimes a lot of time uh, when you also come with the final design <clears throat> so uh, a lot of time the interviewers will also ask like did you have any sort of a design critique uh, with uh, within the company or even like as a designer it's always good that once you're um, done with the use case just like sit together with different heads uh, in your company and sort of like try to figure out like if you've missed out any uh, blind spot in the use case and this can be really helpful for the entire process and uh, yeah so the third point would be that you know like sometimes um, we see uh, i see that you know like the final prototype um, looks very very different from um, what has been what use case has been thought of but the the end uh, case like mostly it looks like really swanky and maybe it never justifies exactly like what pattern should be useful like what um flow is helpful or you know like what color or typography you've used and i think i observe this a lot in portfolios because like this really makes a difference mm -hmm. um yeah, so lastly, we're just gonna go over behavioral questions. So this is common in all interviews. You might be asked questions around how you handle conflict and how you approach collaboration. So this is primarily for you to showcase like how you've handled the following with like concrete evidence, AKA the stories you tell, um, how you handle interpersonal conflict and how you work with people. Cause you know, we're all human it's not perfect in every workplace. Not all personalities get along really like smoothly and automatically. Um, there's, you, you have to kind of interact with people and figure out how to move forward together. Um, and that might, might include interpersonal conflict. It might also happen across difficult project constraints. Um, and companies wanna hear how you creatively work within those constraints. Um, and it might also include questions around missteps and how you recover or just like general time management. Um, so some of the examples of those kinds of questions are like, describe a situation in which you are able to persuade someone um, to see your way of thinking successfully, or, and they often start the same way too. Give me an example of a time you were able to set a goal and you met it, or tell us about a time you ran into obstacles on your last project and how you worked through them. Um, and this is definitely the time to like practice humility and be really self-aware. Um, and so there's one method that I really, I recommend to all my mentees who are going through the interview process around how to prepare for behavioral questions. And it's the STAR method. And this is like a way of telling a story. And so there's different parts to this. There's situation, there's task, there's action and result. And what this might look like in practice, um, I have an example set up here. And it's a lot of words, so I'll just read it out loud. Um, but basically so you set up the situation. And this is actually from a project I've done many years ago. So before working on a new signup flow, I learned the front end developer had a reputation for being really difficult to work with. Multiple designers have worked with him and really did not enjoy that time. And there are a few deadlines missed on past projects. So for this one, I really wanted to make sure that we are successful and can make that deadline. And I, and I felt that the way to get there is to help the team feel invested in the work itself. So I decided to ask for feedback, especially from that front end developer throughout my design process so that they were excited for the work, the team was excited for it and that we could be supportive of each other as we worked on it and got to the finish line. So he ended up suggesting some pretty good creative solutions, he became a really good partner for me as we worked through feasibility and we ended up releasing our project early. And so you can see there's like three sentences here and I hit the situation, task, action, and result. Um, and you can see like that took less than like two minutes to tell that story. Um, and my, my recommendation to people is like, look up a list of behavioral questions online 
for interviews. And you can start to see the commonality, like the themes across all of them. And you might need maybe like four to five stories that you can flex and kind of adjust for any of those questions. Um, so some common missteps um, around these um, are sometimes the stories are really like kind of winding and pretty vague without a clear beginning, middle or end. Um, it's generally not a good sign if your interviewer has to ask you to clarify or like restate the question to get to the answer they're looking for. And then sometimes people don't answer these questions directly because it kind of hits a nerve when you have to talk about something or a situation that's not easy. Um, we all handle difficult situations really differently. And, you know, I, I really vibe with this because like I'm generally an avoidant person, but this is like the time for you to just be like brave and courageous and just put it out there. Um, and then another misstep is talking negatively about teammates, about the company or your users in any way. It really doesn't look it doesn't reflect well on you when like something like that happens. And I might ask you to kind of reconsider how you tell those stories if that comes up and try to find something positive about those challenging situations. And I say within reason, because there are some situations that are just like beyond um, tolerance. But if you can find a way to spin a situation and make it positive, it says a lot about you and your character and your resilience. And it's a very attractive quality for hiring managers because the reality is there's always going to be something that comes, comes up in a project. Because when people are under pressure or there's a deadline or it's like a high pro profile project or there's a lot riding on it, sometimes like not everyone is going to play nice. And then the last one is sometimes folks have a, a difficulty admitting to mistakes or missteps. So it's kind of like the classic, like tell me about a weakness about yourself and you really just say a string. Um, there's like a, there's a way of approaching this where you can be humble and acknowledge things about yourself, but also spin it and say like and showcase that you are resilient and you think strategically. And then um, just a little bit about mindset. So you know, interviewing, looking for a job, everything around it, it's like a deeply vulnerable process. It's like really hard to go through because, you know, you're sending, you're sending your information out in the world and you're hoping for a response back. And with that, like uncertainty and ambiguity, there's a lot of like unknowns. And sometimes we still tell stories about ourselves that aren't true, about why we don't get the email back, why no one's responding. And so I, I think this is something that I like to emphasize with folks is like, it's okay. Like, this is like, a hard process, everyone's kind of going through it in a very similar way. And it really helps to kind of embrace a mindset where you can just acknowledge that you're still learning, you're still growing, that maybe what you're learning today is something you didn't know before, but don't give yourself a hard time about it. Just say like, you know what, I didn't know this. And now I can apply these new skills and this new knowledge on like my next application or my next interview. Ooh, so just like Jen mentioned, like hiring managers are definitely looking for people who have like a growth mindset. By growth mindset, I mean like people who are willing to change, who are willing to learn more, willing to accept mistakes. There's no, um, there's nothing wrong in, um, you know, like admitting to, okay, that something went wrong in the process or like, you know, that you actually leaned on somebody else for help to understand the process better. And this is a very good indicator because, you know, like every uh, team looks for people who they can like work together with collaboratively because that, May, that ensures that you know everyone's happy everyone's working well together and I'm sure you must have heard like uh, that uh, Netflix basically does not accept brilliant jokes so that means like a person who's really good at his work but you know it's like a complete joke to everyone it's like really difficult to work with so you know like um, definitely at like a entrance stage like uh, all the hiring managers are definitely looking into your um, empathy and how well work, how well you work with others and how can you adjust to the team setup and sort of like, uh, you know, like bring everyone to a better stage than like pulling everyone down. Yeah. And just as a party note, for those who need to hear this, especially if you're looking for a job right now, um, be kind to yourself. No one is perfect because we're human. 
Uh, and I, I learned this from a monk in Cambodia. We, each of us is a work in progress. And so what does that mean when you're a work in progress? You're not perfect. You're just learning new things all the time. You're incorporating what you've learned and into improving for the next time. And it's okay to make missteps um, as long as you like look back on them and think like, oh, I can actually recover from this and do better moving forward. Yep. And so those are our slides. Um, I'm gonna hand it back to Ying to handle oh, the next awesome. portion of this. Wonderful, if everyone in the chat can like type a bunch of numbers and letters, show their appreciation or just like claps all around. That was amazing, so insightful. Thank you so much. Also, sharp deck. Like I think everyone in the chat was like, ooh, the, the colors really pop. And this was also very pleasing to, to look at as well. Okay, with that, let's jump into some questions. Okay, so yes, we'll drop another link into the chat for our uh, Q&A on Pigeonhole and that's where you can write your questions in, we can vote on it. That's what I'm looking at right now to pick those questions. So the very top one is from, from Swara and they asked how to ask, how to answer the what is your weakness uh, question in a design context. Um, you know, you can talk, you don't have to be personal about it. You can be about the work itself. So I've worked with designer, like one designer who like really felt like she didn't go deep like in terms of exploring all possibilities for an interaction pattern or like a layout. And so, cause she gets just so excited about like getting to the solution and feeling really good about like maybe the first or second one that she's explored. So that's something you can bring up too, is just like um, sometimes you miss kind of like going deep in the process. Cause you like, you just find the comfort and kind of getting to the solution really quickly. But then you can spin that around and say like, yeah, but this is something I'm, I'm self-aware about and I'm trying to work on and something I'm trying to like get better about. Um, and it, it, can, it can apply to a lot of different things. It's kind of like, uh, this, is kind of, this is very like trite um, metaphor, but it's like when you go on a first date, you're not really gonna unload on that person and say like, well, I'm really conflict avoidant and like, I don't like talking to people I don't like. And like, I don't like doing the research that like precedes the work itself. Like you're not gonna lay it all out there right up front, but you're gonna talk about things that are like relatable and that can showcase that you are someone who's capable of will and willing to grow. I like that, just like, don't, don't just give them a running list. Like here's, here's a bullet list of everything about me. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, your perspective on it as well? Um, I think I completely agree to what uh, Jen said. Uh, and yeah, that's it. I think I leave it at that. Awesome. Okay. Ooh, this one got a lot of votes. This is from Maddie. And they asked, how do we overcome the, you don't have enough experience, have enough projects or experience rejection? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I think... Um, uh, to be honest, like um, if you if you've actually gone in your case study, like uh, if you've sort of like um, you know iterated all of the different edge cases and sort of you know like gone through your entire process, I would really say that there's no like because in our company at Ahuda we hire like real uh, like freshers at all the time. And, you know, like, uh, there's no real reason to say no to anyone like that. But what we look in for freshers is that uh, that they understand uh, the UX process, the um, user story process, uh, problem areas process really well. And if they have, like, a slight idea of, like, you know, how... Uh, it can really depend like if you've not worked with the project manager that's okay but then like how did you prioritize which problem to work with and uh, you know like um, how did you justify your research and did you were you able to find out some loopholes and it was just not like a perfect pr process where you went like hey this is the problem this is the research and I got like a hundred percent results saying yes that this is a problem and this is what I solved for so if anyone who can like justify this process really well um, gives us a very good understanding of how they are able to learn uh, the process better in the next steps and uh, yeah definitely would consider uh, them uh, to be a part of our team 
Yeah, I might add, like, this is a really hard one. And I acknowledge, like, it's one of the, it's one of the hardest things to hear when you're starting out. Cause it's like this like cycle of like, well, I don't have enough projects. Like how do I get projects to get, you know, it's a, it's a circle. Um, sometimes there like, there's a few tactics I think that could work. Um, one is like maybe revisit the projects you have and like think about, okay, if I did this, like if it's a student project, um, if it was a class project, if it was a side project you did, Maybe there's ways you can expand on it and showcase more of your work. Maybe push yourself to give more, like add more to it. Because, you know, it is, it is a self-directed project. So you have that kind of freedom to make it a little bit more elaborate. And that might be enough to catch the eye of the hiring manager who's like, oh, you know what? This person has some promise as a young designer. They just need experience to practice on. Um, and another, like another way of doing it this is like a really hard one because it's it's like you have to find the jobs that are willing to take on the junior um, designers. And it, I, I hate saying it because it's like, okay, but where are they? And like, how do you find them? Um, and I know of some designers who've like really hustled, like they've cold, cold emailed hiring managers for teams they want to join on LinkedIn and built relationships with designers they really admire in the industry. And that really goes a long way because sometimes those folks get told about the positions before they're posted. And so there's like an element to like, what can you do to build your network and get to know other designers and, and just kind of like learn what they did to break into the industry um, to see if there's something you can like glean or learn from there. It's really helpful. It's like, what are some tips that we can slowly edge or edge our way outside of that cycle um, two things that I've that I've mentioned to my mentees before is uh, during the interview process, you kind of do a, a gut, maybe gut check or status check with the interviewer. Like as you're talking through your case study, um, like for example, like so I did I utilized this methodology to get this result. Uh, this is how I solved the problem. Is this something that aligns with your team's current processes, or do you feel like there are some differences we can talk about? Trying to see, trying to see if you can gauge their expectation of experience during the interview. Um, and then another one is like after, you know, that that rejection where it's like, oh, you don't have enough uh, experience. That, that's also a learning opportunity where you can follow up and like think, follow up and say, thank you so much for your candid feedback. Um, I love, I'm always looking for opportunities to grow more. Um, to help kind of guide me is, can you help me understand um, your definition of like, experience certain levels of experience does that mean understanding this certain process or the skill set you know trying to see if you can tease more details out of the the interviewer to to give you some some guiding points to work towards and then who knows that might um that might highlight in them like oh this person is like even with even if they are reject being rejected they are looking for opportunities to grow and all i have to do is just give them some pointers on like this area or this particular skill set and then who knows i they may be the first person in my mind a few months later or a year later from that because they followed up with me maybe like a month later and like, hey, just want to check out check in with you. Thank you so much for your feedback. This is how I've uh, integrated in, into part of my learning process and just wanted to show it to you. And that can go a long way with leaving a great impression and opening the door to more opportunities down the road. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I. I've had a few candidates who didn't get a job, like at the companies I worked at, who've like followed up and said, like, I really enjoyed our interview and I want to stay in touch. And like, that really makes an impression on me personally, because I'm like, yeah, I enjoyed that too. And I'm glad they want to like keep that connection and like potentially could work together in the future where there's the right opportunity for them. Yeah. So there's always ways to kind of find, find the silver lining, find it. It's, it's a long game, that's for sure but that's what building relationships is. <laughs> it's that patience and resilience and exactly. the rejection of any type is very hard as well. And then one thing to understand about the interview process is um, uh, there's so many, so many pieces and factors in place that may not even be related to what you, how you did during the interview that maybe the company decided that the resource was, the position was filled by an internal resource or they lost budget or all these things happen. So you only have control over what you can do. And so those are the actions that you can take to just like 
improve your odds for like the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. Next one. So this is from Anonymous. Uh, how do you, ooh, this one's good. So at, at every interview phase, as you go through it, um, compensation and salary come up. So they had asked, how do you answer questions about salary expectations? Yeah. Um, I have mine, my tips. Mac, did, Mac, did you want to go first? No, oh, sure. Go ahead. Um, so I learned this because I worked with a coach who taught me how to negotiate. Um, I am not a negotiator, like naturally. I'm a very like people pleasing person. And so a really good thing to remember, like throughout the process is like, it depends on what company and like how aggressive they are. Some recruiters are trying to get that answer right out the gate because they don't want to bring people in with un like unrealistic expectations for the role. Um, in that case, like do a little bit of research, look up, like hopefully you have recruiter friends in the industry, like look up what you're willing to say. Um, and then also at the same time, you can play it and keep that number really close, especially if you're not sure what their salary ranges are. Um, and you can say like, look, I just want to make sure this is the right fit for me and for you. And so I don't want to bring salary into this conversation prematurely. Um, there's like, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of push that conversation off and make it about like, I want to find out that this is the right position for me. And I also want to make sure that like, you guys feel really good about me as well for this role. Um, and that's just like one of those negotiation tactics that sets you up really well. So that in the case that you do get the offer, um, you can like play pretty, like play it really well where you can get the salary you want. Um, often it helps to have a number in mind and often it helps to have it based on kind of what the, re the research you've done in the market. Um, but I know in the state of California, I don't know about other states, you can actually ask for the salary range and they're legally obligated to tell you. And that gives you a really good um, kind of like negotiating tactic to play with there. Nice, really helps kind of even that conversation out. Yeah. Cool, yeah. I think I uh, completely agree to what Jen said. And uh, you know, like there are a lot of uh, good resources online where you can actually go and check against, you know, like which role you're applying to and what is the expected salary. And uh, I, would, I would definitely agree that it's good to have a number in mind. <clears throat> but, but of course, yeah, like I think I'm also like a, a similar person that I would like rather avoid like a, a salary discussion heads on. And it just makes me uncomfortable. I'm not really sure why. So, you know, like uh, I, I think like personally, when even I have answered to a lot of uh, interviewees saying that, you know, like, hey, you know, we can like tackle... Uh, this is my expected salary but you know like we can always tackle this negotiation at a later stage in the interview process so um and another thing is like definitely like um, i have made use of uh, use of this like i'm active on twitter so this also kind of uh, circles back to what uh, uh ying and um, uh, jen said that you know like keeping in touch with your uh, mentors and keeping in touch with people in the industry really helps because if you have a good relationship you can always sort of like oh people are quite I in my experience like a lot of people are very um, transparent about uh, you know like what are the salaries that are being offered for certain positions and you can always use that to sort of just ask like you know what is um, the general uh, level of salary that is expected and that also uh, would help you sort of align with what the offer is about and but um, I also feel uh, to be honest like um, after you have been given a number by um, the, uh, uh, by, uh, you know, the company, like, I think it's, it's always good to sort of uh, negotiate it to what you also feel is okay, as far as your needs. And there's no shame in saying that, you know, like, hey, this is what uh, I did my research and this was my expectation. So it would, it would be really great that, you know, if you can like match up and sometimes uh, also look at your offer in case if uh, a company is not able to really match their offer, you can also look at like some of the other benefits that they provide that could also be, um, you know, a part of your compensation. So, you know, like don't, uh, I would say just like don't look at the uh, number and just say like, hey, I'm not going to take up a job with you, but like, you know, just look at it a little holistically and sort of make a decision. Yeah. I remember learning from someone that like 
everything is kind of up, everything is up for negotiation like on the table like when you're in that interview it's like when you have the most position or power or leverage to you know communicate what you're looking for um something I, I heard is that it seems to make sense it's like recruiters would have a range approved before they like go out and look for it so I don't think it hurts to ask that range in the beginning sometimes they kind of go first and like what's your expectation and then you caught off because you're like a, a, a number and then you know you might be shorting yourself so maybe maybe one thing is to ask if they have an approved range um it's and I know it's hard because it's like we always feel so awkward talking about money but it's also something that I'm also working on to be more comfortable about and understand that the interview is a it's a you know a, a transaction right it's like I'm providing a service and a value to you and you're providing me an opportunity so let's see if we can align so it's a yeah. good fit um and then even if it's even if um the it doesn't match or like maybe you say something and you say a range or a number and it and there's a lower like and then they say oh we're not sure we can meet that you can, you can still say like I'm, I'm really happy to talk to you additionally or your team additionally to explain um the context behind that and like why I feel like I can bring that same value to your team and that we both say like yes to each other enthusiastically so it's like it's also having that conversation uh, with the with the sense of like enthusiasm too it's like yeah let's talk about it acknowledge that it's awkward but it's like a necessary part of the discussion and it's good to have practice about it then like kind of skirting around it right next one is uh how do you justify decisions related to color and components that are coming from the design system? So for example, why did you choose that color? Is it's in the design library, we can use another shade. So like explaining um, some of the design decisions, design decisions that were standardized or turned into a process before this person entered in and how do they include that into part of their answer when they're asked about it in an interview? Yeah. Sure. So um, uh, I think that's a very interesting question. And, you know, like I come back, um, I was working at SAP where we have like a really well, uh, like a real good library of components, colors, like everything defined because we had to uh, really align with one design language. And a lot of times, like um, I was working on certain edge cases that were not really like uh, standard for SAP. And um, there was a lot of difficulty to sort of um, you know, talk about like color changes, uh, etc. And towards the end, like in my implemented design, that was not done. But, uh, you know, what I did in my portfolio was that I added a screenshot of like what my ideal expectation was, like the direction I wanted to take this project in and sort of um, I justified it that it was not for the standard SAP customers. And this was like a, a, an experiment. So, you know, like, um, and uh, I was also like, very transparent to sort of explain that you know it's difficult uh, for a company at uh, at a large scale to uh, make changes for like one or two edge cases but you know like i spoke to the design systems team and sort of like told them that hey you know what if we can't add it today that's okay but in the future we should like sort of consider adding this because there could be like more use cases and you know like companies expanding so i think what matters is that like if you had a if you can show that you had a discussion around it. And uh, to be honest, I don't think it's like a, a bad thing that uh, if the design system didn't listen to you, but then at least you did your own best and like spoke to them and brought out that use case. Um, and also like in your portfolio, just feel free to like, you know, showcase like what was the design that was in your mind. Maybe you don't have to show the entire flow, but just like a screenshot of what you thought was like really relevant uh, for the project or for the users. Yeah. I might add to like, especially if you're working within a product that has a very defined design system, you know, you still have like, you can still make choices as a designer. Like if it's a form, you're making choices between like check boxes or multi-select or a drop down in radios. You can really speak to that, um, that you worked within the constraints of the design system and you, Maybe and you, if you believe it, you can say like, I really believe this is the best I could have done within those constraints. And then for like things like colors, there's still like options in the design system for colors. Like usually there's like primary and then like secondary. And then sometimes there are, aren't options for like alerts or um, 
primary action buttons. And so those are things where you just have to acknowledge like, you know, that was, that's, that's part of the design library. Um, it's based on a component, like, and you can talk about why that color is the right one for that place in your design. And you can still talk to like the decision making you made and like the justifications around those choices as well. And I think it shows a lot of maturity when it's like you can move within a design system and make it work for the problem you're solving and speak to that versus like kind of being like the design system is being put on you and you just have to work with it. Like it, that comes across really differently in an interview. And so like really think about how you tell that story and like how you bring in your decision-making and highlight kind of your autonomy and agency in those situations. I love that. It's like reframing it. So it's like, these were um, right. Not like, uh, it's like turning the obstacle into the, into the way that right. you solved, solved for it. And yeah, like, like um, Hot said, you can either take the opportunity to, to reinterpret the, the visual design direction and then show like, hey, this is, this is how I solved the, the product or the, the user problem with the existing um, design library or system. And then I also wanted to you know, take, uh, take it in a different direction in terms of like the UI or the visual design. So you can kind of show two different um, opportunities that you've grown there. So it is kind of like reshaping that, that mindset. Okay, so another one. Uh, what has been the most common slash reoccurring interview questions you've seen in your interviews? Does this mean from the candidate or that we ask candidates? <laughs> I, I think I'm, I think they're saying like from your experience that that in the past when you've interviewed like the ones that have come up when you've interviewed in for roles in other companies. Or it can be, what are your go-to interview questions that you like to ask candidates too? Yeah. I think some that I've heard, it's always an interesting conversation when a candidate brings up diversity, inclusion, and equity at like a company. So like we get that question a lot from designers who apply for Slack and interview. Um, and it comes up as like, what is the design team doing? What is the company doing to address equity and like diversity? Um, and, I, and I often really enjoy those because, you know, it, it gets into a place that I really care about and like value. Um, but I, I often really like, I don't think there's like common questions that really come up in general because it really changes and depends on the values of the designer who's coming in and what they're trying to find and look for. Like some folks really care about like the high bar for design and like pushing it. And they wanna ask like how, how do designers at Slack continue to do that? Or like some folks care more about collaboration and having like equal partnership with like the PMs and engineering leads. So they'll ask about like, what does that look like for this team that I'm joining? Like, what does the collaboration look like? Will I have a voice? Will I have a seat at the table? That sort of thing. Oh, I think for me, it's kind of similar as well. But like Agora is kind of known as, as like a very data first company. So a lot of time, like the questions that I get asked is like, how does how does design like advocate in a world of data? Like, because, uh, you know, like, how is it that we balance like user needs plus data and come up with a design solution? And um, I think this is like one of the most asked question. Uh, secondly, would also be like, um, what is the style of collaboration at Agoda? And you know, like, uh, how do you like really uh, be able to have conversations with the uh, PMs? And sometimes it's even the uh, VPs of the company because it's like a really open structure. So you know, like. Um, you know, how, how, how do you like really bring your point across, like being fearless, still being respectful and uh, respectful of like time, respectful of like how well have you thought of the design solution or uh, whatever the problem is. Mm, yeah, I think, uh, yes. And uh, for, I think for data, like my answer is always like that, you know, data is like, uh, it's, it's just information that's there. There's no need to be scared of data. Like, um, try to be friends with data and data can uh, also be like in terms of like uh, what the engineering team collects like uh, the usage but data is also research right that at the end of the day we have to understand that research also like uh, translates into numbers and as a designer it's a great skill to have 
and um, just just don't be afraid of the numbers ask someone ask for help it it only really depends on you on how you interpret it and um, you know sort of like who do you ask around you to interpret it for you and how you translate it into the betterment of your design that's great so the types types of questions that come up is going to depend on the context of the interview or the the defining characteristics or values for that company um, that you can kind of maybe pull from from their from their company bio or about the role role description that you can then kind of get an understanding of what that structure would be like as well as you know asking the the uh, the HR recruiter as well to have some context on like hey what to expect or like so I can be best prepared I want to make sure I put my best foot forward and you know show you the, the best of what I have thank you so much all right guys with that we're at time so thank you let's everyone let's thank Jen and Mahak for sharing the personal stories and strategies with us let's give it up to our speakers thank you so much for sharing their time and the wisdom and thank you uh, again so much for coming um, we had such a great turnout today. I hope this was super valuable and informative for you. That's our that's our goal. That's our that's what we strive towards. Um, and with that, I'm going to wish everybody goodbye and for our organizers and speakers to stick around. So to all of our attendees, thank you for coming. Be happy, be safe, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone. That was so Bye. fun. Really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. You guys like killed it with all those like <laughs> fire questions too.